All right. Welcome back or welcome to the Yogi Roth Show. And I'm fired up for today's guest for a bunch of reasons. One is that he always rocks great suits. Two, his email is probably turned off because you just heard mine ding there in the background. Um, but three, he's also given back to the game, which I think is a former player, former athlete's responsibility, not just job, but responsibility. It's Jedediah Collins. Jed, I, I call you Jed, but like, like what, what do you want to go by here? Well, I'm being challenged to create a personal brand, and that has evolved into the fullback of finance. So I don't even respond to Jed anymore. It's if you don't call me fullback of finance, it's that's it. Uh, okay. But no, people people can't pronounce Jedediah, so Jed's easy. Okay, well, I mean, it's fullback, H back, tight end. I mean, you can, you literally can do everything. You got all the tools. Um, now you that- you say that, and my only job in this podcast, I have one rule. I may have told you this before, but it's, I only ask questions I don't know the answer to. Hmm. So uh, fullback of finance, when I think of fullback, it is a guy who does the dirty work. Mm -hmm. It is the person who is limited in terms of they're not on every play. Mm -hmm. It is the person who's got to kind of like, kind of clean up and pass pro, tell the running back which way to go and (laughs) kind of keep the locker room together. Like you are a cog that doesn't get a lot of limelight. Why did you choose that as the analogy to your beautiful name? So in many parts, it's, it's, what you're, it's what you just described, protector, communicator, uh, you know, coach on the field and friend in the locker room. But how I always saw what my main job, number one, was, uh, and I did a lot of things on the football field, but I, once I found success was when I realized what my number one job was. I was a lead blocker. I led the way. And so as a fullback, I led the way. I showed you where to go. In the financial world, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm helping people begin their plans, and I'm leading the way. I'm, I'm opening a hole for them that they would not have either seen or known how to get to. Um, and so to me, it kind of connects the two worlds that I've been a part of, and it, it has a cute little catchy catchiness to it, which, hey, marketability. You're, you're in media. You get it. <laughs> totally, totally. And we're going to talk about it. Your book, uh, Your Money Vehicle, How to Begin Driving to Financial Freedom mm-hmm. is out. You can get that anywhere you want to get books. You've got an amazing podcast. Um, but I want to talk about leadership first. You know, you as a young athlete, when did you recognize that you had the skill set? And, and did you? No. Um, I, the first time I thought I could even play in the National Football League was going up an elevator about week four of my senior year of college. And I was in there with an older gentleman. He happened to have a Chargers kind of polo on. And he asked me as we exited the elevator, he said, hey, do you know where Coach Doba's office is? And uh, I said, yeah, sure, I'll show you the way. And we walked over over there. And as he about to go in, he turns to me, shakes my hand. He said, thanks, Jed. I didn't give you my name. He said, well, you're one of the two players I'm here to see. You know, I was really excited about what you've been doing. And, you know, my senior year, I started to take off, find some success. And he said, I think you would fit perfectly in our system. And that was really walking away the first time I ever visualized the NFL being a reality. It, it had been like a far off dream, but I was studying for my GMAT. I was going to go get my CPA. Like I, I played at Washington State, great institution not a, a you know prolific football powerhouse and I only started one year I only started my senior year now I know you're going to ask did you lead the nation as a as a tight end in receptions yes I did for most of it I missed my last game and somebody passed me but it, it wasn't something that I realized I was able to do in, even in the NFL getting cut 12 times it was a, a learning process and that's where the rookie to veteran mindset and principles really came from was stealing stuff from every locker room I walked in and out of Cut 12 times you weren't a dude in Pullman until your final year where did you develop resiliency and Mm. and how was it how was it I don't know if it was taught to you or how did you absorb it it was taught um and this is why you know one of the considerations I I've always considered myself is a great failure um and that's because failure does not defeat me where I learned it was in my backyard. My brothers are a year and two years older than me, and they're both basketball players. And my dad invented a game called King for a Day. And I loved and hated this game. We played one-on-one basketball, and the winner got to boss the other two brothers around. 
go get me a drink of water, go take out the trash. My dad would go cut stuff off on the lawn and say, hey, who's going to go clean that up? And of the thousands of times we played King for a Day, I remember very vividly the two days I won. I was the younger brother. I was, you know, not at the time, I was not as good of a basketball player as them, even though basketball was our family sport. They both went on, played Division One basketball. They were pretty good. Um, but I remember in, you know, my youth going out onto the court, knowing I was going to lose and starting to change my mindset, starting to change my approach and my attitude towards what King for a Day meant for me. If I couldn't beat Lenny and Jake, I could get better. I could find success in my own realm. And eventually it made me not only the best basketball player, but it made me the best athlete and the best competitor because where they got just defeated by, by a miss, by a loss, by a failure, I knew it was just feedback. I knew it was, it was just a way that I needed to get better and a way to start on a new path and a new journey. And so that mindset was definitely developed, and that was the only reason I could withstand you know, the, the NFL's feedback of, of Jed, you got to get better at this position or else you're never going to be here. Oh, that, that's pretty cool. I'm going to definitely bring King for a day and with our two boys. They're you one month is. old and five years old. Could we start like today? Do you think we could just? <laughs> I don't I don't know what the one-year-old's going to be able to do, but yeah. yeah. I Def- one month that. old. I said oh, one-year-old because I'm so sleep deprived. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. I, I think that's really interesting. So if you were playing now and you didn't play till you were a senior, do you think you would have entered the portal? Like, do you think you would have been able to still tap into King for a day and deal with what current student student athletes are dealing with? I don't think so. Um, Though I was, you know, it's a, it's a great question. I I would have loved because I'm a competitor. I would have loved to believe I would have. I don't think my parents would have let me. They, they epitomize student first. And I was not at college to play in the NFL. I was at college to get an education Um, in my dad's eyes, you know, losing a season probably would have said, well, now you have more time to go to to go to class. Why don't you take some more school? Um, I think I would have turned my eyes to beyond the game and, and not because I didn't love it, but because it was just unrealistic for me to think I was going to get a chance and let alone make a career playing in the NFL. Like those guys are the best in the world. How was I going to compete with them? Um, I see the ones who have the potential, who have been told that is a possibility, that's a reality. Once that dream becomes real in your mind, which is the first step of success, then I would be, I would see people transferring and changing. Um, It is just such a devastating, hard, challenging time for student athletes. But one thing I am in, in kind of pushing back and challenging them to do is, is saying, how are you going to use this time? Don't just look at this as a loss. Sure. It's a, it's a fail. And if you let fail defeat you, you let it defeat you right now is a gift. I look at it as no different than your freshman year or your, your rookie year in the NFL. You're not supposed to play. You're supposed to learn. So what are you going to learn on the field and off develop skills? Yeah, so David Shaw just said something that I I love. I don't know if you caught it yet. Uh, He's on Mike Greenberg's show, his new show on ESPN. And he was describing what it was like to tell his players the season would be postponed. And I think anybody in their right mind, and I don't consider anybody in the SEC in their right mind, uh, (laughs) but anyone in their right, and I have no problem saying that, but anyone in their right mind would say, yeah, it's going to be really hard to do this, right? You could have said that in March, April, May, June, July, let alone here we are in August. With that said, he said his players came back with a sense of gratitude after he told them that the season was postponed. And part of that, I I bet a lot of that had to do with like my coach is making sure he's doing the best thing for us health wise, right? Where Stanford is located, the community, campus, all things going on with COVID-19. I heard that and loved it. But I also think, uh, I think about it in another term, which you just referenced, which was If I'm given, and the NCAA just gave student athletes a sixth year, basically a free year. Free year. Right now, I'd be thinking, man, like I basically got a trial run at when my career is over. Holy shit. Mm -hmm. Your book talks a lot about it of like, oh, yeah. When your career is over, college, the NFL, you're oftentimes lost. We know that I was that way. I'm sure you had an element of that. I'll ask you that in a second. But 
I just look at this time now for athletes, football players specifically, to say, hey, you get you get like a dry run at this. Like you're really not on the streets. Like you're still getting a scholarship check. You're still going to class, yeah. but you kind of get to test the waters and see what real life without your sport is like. What, what, what do you think about that? I think, and again, you're that that free year. What would we have? Do, would I have had the mindset or the wherewithal to say, "Wow, this is a gift"? Why we call the present the present is because it is a gift. I would challenge them and I would ask them, "What what can you do?" I would say three areas you can really get better. Number one is health. We all know as athletes, the moment you start, the moment you are no longer a hundred percent. So how can you get back to a hundred percent? Then number two would be a skill. What is a skill beyond the field? that you should start developing, whether it's, hey, a podcast, social media, Excel documents, a million other ones that are going to be necessary in this new normal of a world. How can you capitalize? You as a 20-year-old, 22-year-old, were just put on a level playing field as a 52-year-old who's been working their entire career and now is pivoting. So what is that skill? You can walk and look them in the eye and say, I can help you here. In the third one, and this is one I've already started to uh, utilize at Washington State, and I think every Pac-12 school and probably, probably university needs to do this, is this is the time to build a network. This is the time to be a mentor and to say, hey, who do you know? I get it. You want to talk to me right now. I'm the starting running back. I'm the starting wide receiver. I don't care. I'm on the football team. I want to meet somebody in our community. I was brought on this campus being told, it's more than just what you know, you join a family. Like we, we care about you, but prove it. Now's the time. I got time. Who, who can I sit down and have a virtual coffee with? Just click a button. Yeah, I, I agree. I always reference the, uh, this is kind of tongue in cheek, but like the, the football card that you have this card mm-hmm. when you're a player, right? Oh, it gets you a lot of things. Doors. It opens yeah. doors and whether that's uh, special treatment for injuries, whether that is extra study and tutors, or that's like getting into a club, like the football card opens doors. It, mm-hmm. it also, and I was told this as a freshman, Jed, um, every day after practice, the advice from our fifth year senior starting quarterback said, get three business cards. And mm-hmm. I never forgot it. And now yeah. it's even easier because you can DM 30 people uh, yeah, and just go down that database of Wazoo, Pac-12, college football yeah. influencers and yeah, I, I'm glad you're doing that at Washington State. It's, it's clearly needed, and, and I know it's being received well. Uh, but for you, you, you also made a pivot. You know, you played, mm-hmm. and well, let, me, let me finish there. Like, did you expect to play as long as you did? Like, here you are week four. Holy shit, someone in the NFL is interested in me. Yeah. And then 10 years later, you're still playing in the league. Yeah, no, absolutely not. I'd be a, a fool to say as an undrafted free agent, I expected to survive for seven seasons. Um, especially as I, I was transitioning positions. So I was learning to, to compete at a new place again against the best, against the hungriest. Um, so no, I, I, and that was the, the beginning of my journey. Uh, and so the be a pro mindset is, is principle number one from Rookie to Veteran. It begins with confidence, trust, and value. And so that was really my evolution was the first person to believe I deserve to be in that starting huddle had to be Jedediah Collins. It had to be. If I didn't believe it, Lord knows nobody else was going to. And then the team had to trust that on a daily basis, they knew what player was going to show up. The the idea of being a pro means they can count on you during practice, they can count on you during the game, and they can count on you without question. And then the last one, and something I love to share, is pros make plays. Like Pros make you say their name they know how to find value. And so for me as a fullback, I was looking for ways to add value. And it was when I finally got opportunities on special teams beyond my resume. I'm a five flat 40 guy. Nobody is lining me up to run down on kickoff. But once I got a couple reps and I made a tackle or two and people said, all right, just let us see him how he can do it. Once I was able to add value I knew it was going to be my job. And then, and then that confidence grows, and then it becomes the competitiveness of nobody's going to take this from me. So getting cut 13 times, right? Yeah. Right now, the only thing really uh, that is enjoyable regarding football is hard knocks, and we're watching people get cut <laughs> as yeah. the episodes continue to come out. At what point do, does it just get hard 
for you? Or do you just keep saying, okay, I'm going to prove you wrong or I'm going to prove myself right? How, how did you deal with that? You get to that, but that is not your initial reaction. And, and people say like, oh, a dozen times, it probably gets, no, you don't get numb to it. It's a shot in the heart. It is somebody calling you, typically somebody you don't know, and telling you your dream is over. And, and really, not only your dream is over, but awaken to the rest of your life, awaken to reality. Um, and so it, it was not easy. I'm a big, you know me, and you are as well. I'm a big journaler. So I love writing, and I got to capture each and every one of those emotions. Um, I actually just got to look back uh, in my journals uh, to 2009. Uh, because Jason Wright, who just became uh, president of the Washington Football Club, he, uh, he and I had a great interaction in Arizona. And that's why you journals, because I went back and I, I remember that story. Um, but it is, it is such a therapeutic th- thing to, to have gone through it, to, to fear, fe- face that fear, because it, it thickened my skin. It still hurt. But I was able to look it in the eye and smile and know it wasn't going to destroy me. That's how I began to pivot to now I get to prove you wrong. Now I'm going to keep going on. Um, but I was fortunate that the phone kept ringing. You know, that, that was a, a blessing that I didn't realize. I also got to enjoy once I was on the other side of it a lot more because I died before I lived. I died a lot before I lived. And so I not only appreciated it, but I wanted to capitalize on it. So prove you wrong versus prove yourself right. Like, did you ever come to a crossroads there? So I consider it the difference between being motivated and being inspired. Um, So motivated, I'm running from something. Motivated is I'm trying to prove you wrong. Inspiration comes from within. Inspiration means I'm running towards something I want. Um, and absolutely, you know, in the depths of it, in, in the middle of, you know, the day of 15 lead ISOs, proving you wrong is only going to get you so far. It had to come from the beast within. It had to come from, you know, I looked in the eyes of not even the linebacker. I looked in the eyes of the other fullbacks and said, I want this more than you. And that was it. That was enough. Once I saw any kind of hesitation, any kind of cringe, I knew I wanted it worse. And that, that didn't come my rookie year. That came after being cut. And that came after I desperately knew I was either going to make the team or I was going to get on IR. Do you think that uh, the other fullbacks could sense that? Do you think they knew in their gut and Jed, Jed wanted it more? I think so because as a fullback, one, it's a position of will more than skill. Um, and as a fullback, we had our judgment day and we all know what it is when it comes. And everybody knows is because it's the second day of pads. We have one run play in and it's who's got the pop gun, who's got the machine gun. Um, and so those days came and I, I think once I was, you know, the player I became, I established that authority. I, I held my chin up a little higher that day. I fiend or faked uh, a, a excitement for it. Um, I, I was as scared as everyone, but I knew the character I had to portray. And that character was the guy who got me out on the field and was able to do the job. Yeah, I've always felt like in football, I've only seen, this, this would have been my 20th year in major college football. I've only seen one player get screwed. And it was a kicker. Like, I do think at the end of the day, your teammates, the people in your position room, and I think the same thing as a professional, everybody just knows. You know, mm-hmm. you don't want to say it if you've got, like, you know, competitive spirit or a relative ego, which we all do. But I, I think everybody knows whether it's like, yeah, no, you know, Jed's got his stuff together, you know, rookie to veteran, his financial world. Or I hope my colleagues would be like, yeah, Yogi, like, as an analyst, like, yeah, he's dialed. Yeah, I, I don't need them to tell me, but you kind of you hope that they feel it because I think as an athlete, as a former walk-on, like guys felt me. They, I wasn't going to take their job with my skill, but I would take it with my brain mm-hmm. or with effort. And I don't know. I just think that's interesting because here we are with athletes and their identity taken away to a large degree without playing. And I think the world has moved on 
right? Pac-12 football isn't playing, Big Ten football isn't playing, but the world has moved on to college, NFL, other sports, unemployment, politics. There's a lot, yeah. there's a lot happening. There's, there's, yeah. So now all of a sudden you're not, you know, your tweet doesn't get a hundred favorites or your Instagram doesn't get a thousand likes. So I, yeah. I hope athletes now sit back and they're like, okay, well, I just need to be felt. And you know, Pete Carroll told me this at 19. He said, Yogi, your job is just to create value. That's it. Mm-hmm. And I, and that hit me at 19. And I don't know, I'm curious how you feel about that because you quit your, you know, great day-to-day job. Yep. Go create value, double down on your own brand, your own story, your own offering to athletes. I mean, it is one, I think it's the, the dawning of the modern day athlete. Currently we are going through it. You look at, you know, and we, we, we don't need to dive down this, but you look at the two univer- the two conferences that have postponed are the two that players unified athletes, college athletes are uh, conscious and aware and intelligent enough to fight a battle. And they were willing, at least at first, they were willing to say, we will sacrifice our own careers because that is the difficult part about change is the first people have to be able to sacrifice. Um, And so that was a really interesting evolution for me and seeing the modern day athlete. And with that, they are seeing the idea that they are no longer becoming a business in the NFL. One of the ideas as a rookie is you walk in and people say, you have to want to, you know, find a gray beard. One of the best things I ever heard was Brian Dawkins say, you have to be the CEO of your own career. You have to, excuse me, Brian Westbrook, both, both on the Eagles at the time, Brian Westbrook, a running back. Uh, and I was just fortunate to be sitting next to him because I was the fullback and that lesson was my rookie orientation and he wasn't even directed at me. And I look at the college athlete today. I look at the high school athlete today. They have to act like a business. They have to think like a business person, a CEO. Um, And so as I pivoted, you know, I was very fortunate because I was getting my certification in financial planning, the CFP while I was still playing. So as I transitioned from the game, I knew what area I wanted to head down. But for five years, I was an advisor. I was in wealth management. I realized I wanted to go help a different criteria of people. I wanted to have a different service. And so I launched this money vehicle uh, course curriculum book. Um, And it was intended to say, Jed, as as a 22-year-old getting his first checks in the NFL, was not ready financially to handle that. How can we prepare people? And it's not an athlete course. So the book, which was tremendously received, we created 35 short videos, five to seven minute videos that takes you through a virtual financial literacy course. That is what we want to go and empower the nation with. We, I want a million people to go through this course because it introduces you and asks those first 10 questions on a financial journey. And it is, it is so humbling to me for people who sit and go through it to say, my mom walked past on the third video. Now me and my mom watch every video together. Uh, I've come from a lower economic family, lower economic community. I'm now sharing this with the people in my community because nobody has ever taught them this language. Uh, And so that's where I doubled down. I said, football afforded me a luxury of, of saying, if I, if I don't have to go for profit first, can I do people over profit? And right now I'm, I'm trying to stay straight and narrow and figure out how I can impact as many people as possible. Love that. So with, with that said, let's just say, and, you, and you've done this in real time, let's just say I'm Jihad Woods, right? I'm a three, four year starting linebacker in a major college program. He's at Washington State. Um, he doesn't look like Lawrence Taylor from a size standpoint, but he's extremely productive. He'll get his chance, I'm sure, at the Mm -hmm. next level. But what would you tell him now with season off? How do you coach him to be the CEO of his own business? And this is, you know, and to tip his own cap, and I hope I don't offend him, but he reached out. He asked me. So we have had this conversation. And he reached out because he said, I'm interested in this field. Do you know anyone who could introduce me, sit me down and talk to me about this field? And I said, absolutely, brother. I was so impressed with his transition. 
he heard the season and you're right. He was up for awards. He was going to try to be a all pack 10 pack 12 all American. He is going after those prizes and it was taken, taken away from him. And his immediate pivot was how do I continue to get better? How do I improve myself? Which is why he is the player he is on the field. My, my advice to him was twofold was number one, Continue to find those skills that are going to help you beyond the game. And I mean, we, we talked football, and he's definitely watching film and, and getting his body right. But number two was that networking piece, was a, a course that I'm going to start teaching at Washington State, is going through the rookie to veteran principles. And I'm going to bring in former Washington State athletes to build that community, to build that networking. And so I his advice to himself that he went through me was who can I connect with? Who, who should I be talking to me probably should be one of your first ones. Cause I love people and I connect all the time. And then here are some cats in, in that specific, you know, genre that would really serve you well to not only listen to, but just to meet because everybody right now wants to play in that football card. Like you said. Yeah, that, that's really cool. Okay, so now talk to me and say I'm a high school kid, mm-hmm. right? Because what I think is happening in high school and name, image, and likeness, which I completely support, yep. is also, I think, completely overblown and overhyped. Oh, yeah. I think this year, Justin Fields, Trevor Lawrence, only guys making real money in college sure. football, right? But there's a lot of young men that I meet in high school at the Elite 11 or the opening that have 40, 50, 70,000 Instagram followers, Mm -hmm. have a little bit of a platform. I'm worried about them because I think now, like the Tate Martell or Max Brown, those are quarterbacks that are offering an eighth grade, that's going to happen to another kid. All of a sudden, they're going to start thinking about building their business really early. And I think without a business, I think every college athlete goes through a part part of their life where they're like, I hate the game. I call it the wonder switch where the the wonder switch gets turned off and it gets dark and you're like, man, this is a job, man, this isn't fun anymore, man. I can't wait till it's over. And then it is. And of course you miss it like crazy. Totally. So what would you say to like the families of those high school recruits whose kids are 30 plus offers, boatload of Instagram, social media followers, and everybody promising and telling them, Hey, your, your kid's going to be three and out. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, number one, I would say take the money vehicle course. Let's just say uh, no. Amen. Uh, <laughs> uh, it is so challenging because y- you're right. They are going to, no matter how much success you have, you're going to face those waves. And even in, a, a, again, a journal entry I put out, not even the part I was highlighting, but a, a sentence beneath it, it said something like, I just hate the game right now. And people saw that and started commenting on it. And Every athlete would would understand that. People appreciate, especially when you're you, when you're playing a violent game. It is a love. You're passionate. It's a love hate deal. Um, to that young player, I was never in that position. I was never the hyped up, you know, all American, everybody touting on me kind of person. I agree with you. I think the NILs is a really interesting proposition. Would players like me ever make a dime? No. I see it as a slippery slope because the University of Oregon is going to be able to dole out and dish out more money than Washington State ever could. Is that unfair? Probably. Um, But to that young athlete, I would say the same thing I say to rookies, which is, number one, you got to know how to take care of your money. I I love talking to the NFL classes this last offseason about Black Lives Matter. You guys want to make societal change? Do you know one way you have to get in order before you can do that? Your finances. Things don't move without money. And that's just a cold, hard truth. And so I looked at these young men and said, you are the next wave of wealth. You could make make that impact, but you got to be able to handle your things right. So number one is get that money in order. Number two, find those mentors. You're you're a 15-year-old, call up a 19-year-old. They have gone through the journey. You know, I, I, Matthew Stafford, who I got to play with, he was the number one Gatorade player of the year, number one player out of high school, number one player out of college. He's been a, a pro bowl player. 
that guy has experienced that. There's always been somebody who's experienced it. So find them and you'll be shocked at who is open to that relationship. Um, And then last but not least, just find a way to stay humble. But in the same sense, by humble, I mean learn. So never considering, I got to talk to Chase Daniel, who's a a good buddy, and he's like, man, these young cats, all they got to do is keep learning. And I think when you're hyped up and you're given that trophy at first, it's hard to keep learning. Um, So to, to have that humility of like, I, you know, Michael Jordan never stopped. And that's why everybody hated him, because he never stopped. But that's what made greatness. And that's, that's what I, when I got to be close to greatness, it was the guys who would never stop learning. Yeah. So the pivot I, I often do when I talk to teams, it's pretty funny. I, I, I ask them, how many of you by show of hands think you're a brand? Everybody mm-hmm. raised their hand. And I said, okay, start naming some brands. And we name all the brands you could think of. Coke, Pepsi, Apple, Nike, Adidas, Beats. Every time, Jed, yeah. every time. I've probably done this speech 40 sometimes. Not once has a player said a human being's name. Uh, Jordan? Do it nope. now? No, nope. yeah. I mean, Jordan Brand maybe once or twice, but it's never been like no. Tiger or LeBron. Yeah. And those are legitimate brands. My point is that what I tell these kids is, what if at 14, 15, 16, 21, you're going to make five grand off of whatever sponsorship? Cool. I think it's more valuable if you find out what you're really interested in versus taking the quick influencer cash. Now, everybody needs it. And I think there's a balance there between, hey, what can I get paid? How can I get paid? Is it easy money? Like you and I will do an influencer deal here and there. But really, I look at it even now in my own career, I'll talk to a company and they'll say, hey, we're going to give you 300 bucks for an Instagram post. And I'll say, cool, but how about we be content partners? What story are we trying to tell? And I think that if if you were Dorian Thompson Robinson or any of these guys who have followings or YouTube pages, Kayvon Thibodeau, um, or the kids we don't even know who are in eighth grade being offered, it's more about... What am, what am I interested in? What clothes am I wearing? Like observing what my, what my personal decisions are every day and then building towards that. So then when it's an opportunity to cash the check, like I can cash a big one. Like maybe I own a company. Perfect example, Sam Ellinger. Sam Ellinger is leveraging the daylights out of UT alums to create an amazing company. He's not getting paid on because he can't right now per NCAA rules, but he's going to own a dope company backed and supported by UT alums when his career is over. It's like perfect, right? Because he leaned into what he did versus spending all my time. If it was name, image, and likeness for him, I bet he would still be very diligent with the ones that he would say, yeah, pay me. Give me the easy cash. But brother, what you just described is a mindset of what do you want most of what do you want right now? And that idea is one, extremely challenging for a teenager it it is has every application to money. You want to talk about finances, everybody throws out the latte example or whatever you want. Like, what do you want right now versus what do you want most? And if if you are able, I get to live down the street from Amazon, who is just taking over the world day by day, but because they base their entire methodology around what you just described. I don't want three hundred dollars today. That does, you know, it, it's sure it's nice. You give me 300 bucks, I'm going to go buy a, a pair of Lululemon pants. What I would rather is gain market share, gain skills, gain a network, gain something for the big picture, for the long term. We're all in a long term game. One thing that you have done extremely well is social media, is building your media brand. That's a thing that so many young athletes are like, ah, you know, but, uh, more and more is starting to see it and say, if I can get 5,000 followers in college, if I can get 10, 50,000, that's a, a market. That is something that is going to stay with you. That is going to pay you forever. And if you can do it without making a dime and go get 20,000 followers in the next decade, it's going to pay you 10 times whatever somebody would pay you today. Yeah. You know, it's a great example. Of that is, uh, and I'm sure, you know, Emmanuel Acho. Yes, um, he's a buddy who clearly has exploded on the scene with uncomfortable conversations with a black man. Just had uh, Roger on, right? Just had Roger Goodell on. It began as a YouTube series, and then Oprah brought him into her book club, and he's got a book coming out, right? Like just wow. showing up, like 
the phrase I love is like, can you meet the moment? He met the moment with his yes. passion, with his heart, with his soul, and would have done it for free, did it for free, probably paid yeah. for the first couple of productions on his own. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, here we are three, four months later, he's got a book deal with Oprah. I mean, that to me is, that's really cool versus like, hey, man, this backpack company is, they could hook you up with five hondo. Yeah. Or, so anyway, all right, let's, let's pivot from there. Um, let's just say I don't know anything about finance other than I don't want to be broke, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And I'm an athlete and my career is over. And I got to start the next phase of my life because a lot of the listeners I have are not only just athletes, but also people that have just finished three or four years out of the NFL or college. What do you say? Like if we just pretended this was an initial meeting and here I was with, I really didn't have any money. I wasn't out on the streets, but I have a little apartment. I'm just kind of hanging out, trying to figure out my next step. What does the fullback of finance say to me? I mean, we begin with mindset. Uh, I think no different than stepping out on a field. That's where the conversation has to begin. Uh, who, you know, and Yogi, you get in playing that character. Answer this question for me. Fill in the blank. Money is. What is the first thing that popped in your head? For me, it's the, it offers me the ability to travel. That's there you how go. I've always looked at it. Money is a, and why we call it money vehicle is money is a transportation. Money allows you to travel. Money is not the destination. And that is one of the first mindset mm. shifts I have to really get people to understand is you don't want a million dollars. You want the lifestyle a million dollars reflects. So let's start looking and describing that. I'm a big believer in thoughts become things. Napoleon Hill, like think and grow rich. You start to really visualize what you want. And then we build out a strategy and a plan to get there. So I, I begin by looking at what that relationship you have today is we also got to turn around and look a little bit in the past and realize you know our families our parents our, our relatives they've influenced what our relationship is with money and so do we see money negatively positively money with anxiety money scarcity or money abundance like how do you see it um, and then I start to play through this concept of time because as you just mentioned time is a key component and in money, time is everything. And so I challenge people by saying, what type of or are you? Are you a spendor? You make money, you spend money on a day-to-day. -day. Are you a savor? You make money and then you save it up for a couple months or a year-to-year -year for a specific objective. Or do you become an investor? And very few of us have ever even been introduced to what an investor mindset is. And it's simply somebody who has the ability to see money on a decade time frame, perhaps even decade to decade time frame. Um, so as people begin their journey, I really like to identify where they are, what the relationship has been, and then where you want to go. No different than an, as an athlete, your plan is only as good as your destination. So you really got to know why you are going to begin to empower yourself around money. And I think that is perhaps the most important to, part to establish. That, that's really cool. Um, I, I, I do a lot of uh, like meditation and uh, breath work. I don't know if you've ever done breath work. So I just, love it. Cool. So uh, a lot of that, you tap in your subconscious. And like you, like I've gone on a one, our friend does it where it's like, this is a financial breath work. So you, th you go to huh. like, what is like, what was your block or what is your pain body or what is like in your world around money? And you're like, well, like my wife is a daughter, or is an immigrant. I'm the son of a refugee. Right. Yeah. So like we saved everything. I mean, everything. we didn't have cable as a kid. So my whole life has been save, save, save. And it wasn't until six months ago we bought our own for our, our, I bought my first house with my mm -hmm. wife, obviously. And as you go through that process, I was like, man, I wish I bought something 10 years ago. <laughs> right. But I was a savor. That was mine, like a hundred percent. And I, I just think that I wouldn't even have known that if it wasn't for like coming to that realization six months ago. But I wish I came to you 16 years ago, <laughs> you know, or whatever it would have been when I was finishing my college career. Yeah. And that's so that's exactly what I wanted to create. That's exactly what the money vehicle course is. And because, number one, financially, it wasn't going to be scalable for Jed to sit down one on one with everybody. I've sat down with hundreds and thousands of people. I love people. We go and do workshops. But why the video course really works is because 
you take it on your own time. You start to learn these things on demand. And I agree with you. You know, like I, I, you know, my first paycheck came and went. I was a spendor. I bought an engagement ring. My wife and I are still happily married. But that woke me up to the reality of like, man, I'm never going to walk away from the game looking at what it gave me. I'm going to walk away from the game looking at what it took because I'm not going to have anything to show. I get to stand in front of teams, NFL teams, rookies, and say, your dream was to not walk across a stage as a rookie. Your dream is to walk out of this locker room as a veteran and have some money and some memories to show for it. And that idea of rich rookie, which means rich is I have money today, and veteran wealth, which means I have many days I don't have to worry about money. That is a big designation of a journey. I know doctors, lawyers, athletes that make five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars a year that have fifteen thousand dollars in their savings account. That is not wealth. That is rich today. Wealth is an entirely different mindset and an entirely different way to get peace of mind. So true. And I think too, like neither one of us are that old, but we also had our twenties where I'm sure we had a great time. Yeah. And I look back now and I'm like, yeah, we definitely had a great time. And there were nights where we went out and did our thing, but man, I, I don't really remember a lot of them in terms of like great memories. I'm not like, Oh no. yeah, thank God we did this and stayed in this hotel. You know, yeah. it's more of, yeah, thank God I didn't blow every penny that I saved because I wouldn't, it, it means nothing. And as you get older, you're like, yeah, you're right. Like it'd be cool to own something or to have a little flexibility. And um, yeah, I just think you're on it, man. It's, it's really cool to to talk to you about this in this, in this format. Cause you know, we got our few minutes here and there at our yeah. Washington state events, but never get to go there. Never get to, never get to dive, man. And, and like you said, the first times we met, we we're both journalers, writers at heart, uh, which makes us kindred spirits. And I think part of the reason you're able to create and to, to put on the, the brand you are is because you're tied into that emotional self. You, you are very conscious of not only what you are going through, but what others are going through. And that's a skill I, I continue to admire in you, man. And it's, yeah, it's always good to catch up. Totally. All right. So last uh, two questions I have um, before we close this thing out. Your Money Vehicle is your book. What do you get out of writing? Like, what, what does it feel like for you? Clarity. Um, so many people are like, well, how do you... So Your Money Vehicle was journal entries to myself and thinking about like, well, how was I starting to understand these financial concepts? Um, and then I would just write little stories and analogies truly to myself on the way to and from work because I was trying to learn them better. Writing to me is the closest spiritually you will ever get because it is your true emotions, your true heart, your true feelings, your true thoughts. And sometimes I go back and I read a page I just just got done writing and I'm like, wow, I didn't even know that was weighing that much on me. But when you can categorize it into a book format or categorize it into an article, a concept I've become recently more aware of is the difference between general knowledge and specific knowledge and specialized knowledge. And this idea that you can Google or YouTube absolutely anything out there. But what I wanted to do with your money vehicle is put it in a synchronized series that is going to take you and take step by step with you. That specialized knowledge is the beginning of action. General knowledge, you typically just learn, you don't do anything. And so why I'm not an educator, I'm an empowerer, is because I want to give you the confidence to go and act. And that's why each chapter has its different action items, a specific one, but it has others, but it has a specific one with each chapter. And chapter 10 ends with the idea around a Roth account. And my goal, because people told me I needed a trackable goal, can't just be a million people, I want to open a million Roth accounts. And very recently, people have been pushing back and saying, I need to raise that number. But I I really think if I can empower people to use money, understand it, strategize it, and be efficient with it, U-S-E, that will lead to why I write. I write to make an impact for myself and to make an impact for those who are going to read it. 
That's awesome, man. Um, and make sure you check out that book, JedediahCollins.com or Amazon, wherever you get your books. Or better uh, yet, go and take the course, yourmoneyvehicle.com forward slash drive. You can take the video course. It's $100, 35 videos, and you will not, not regret the investment. Yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to sign up for that. Um, so your fullback, fullbacks aren't necessarily known, and fullbacks are relatively extinct. But on your book, there's not a picture of you. <laughs> well, why not? Like, well, is that a, just a fullback move right there? Um, because my my this is going to – so the vision is not – Jedediah, fullback of finance is not money vehicle. Money vehicle, I want to go beyond me. Um, we already have a grip of young contributors and young thinkers that are creating the content that are truly going to be how this thing catches fire. We have students at USC. We have students at UCLA who are going through the course looking around and saying, it doesn't matter where you are on a college campus. This course is not being taught. So why I didn't want to put my face on it was because this is not Jed's story. It's your money vehicle. You have to, one, adapt that mindset of money vehicle, but also make it your own. That's awesome. That is a, I'm not surprised. That is a selfless act in a world uh, fullback. where- Fullback yeah. has to be selfless. <laughs> I love it. All right. So uh, last couple of questions here. I'm curious for you. You've been through a lot. You've been cut uh, 12 times. You've you played for a decade. You, you've got a great story. You've got a business. But what is it now that you know for sure? I know for sure I have to block my time. I know when I get really flustered, overwhelmed is when I feel pressured that I didn't control my day better. I was in things that were not efficient or effective. I didn't get to go see my girls who are at amazing ages at six and four. Um, you know, I didn't, everybody juggles and we all are overwhelmed and, and we all get hit with waves. People are like, Jed, you know, your videos, they're motivating. You never get, you know, lack I get hit by waves of negativity just like everyone else. Um, and I should probably share those more. But what I know now is I need to do a better job controlling my calendar and really being able to prioritize what I need to get done and, and be confident in saying no. That's a hard lesson for me to learn is, is the confidence in saying no. So with that, uh, what is it, if you had to finish the sentence, how would you say the following? It all comes down to. It all comes down to adding value. Uh, I I am a big believer, you know, in as an undrafted as a, you know, no name player most of my career, and I I did have some good years and accolades, but I knew every moment I stepped on a field court. I know every moment I step into a, a relationship in the corporate world. I know everything in my seeing my wife and my kids, I need to be adding value. And if I can do that, I know I'm at least headed in the right direction. Everything else I can figure out. Love that. So you talked about a million Roth accounts. What, um, what do you think it is now that you're seeking with all the things you have going on? Feedback. Uh, well, now, now I'm seeking impact and I'm getting it. That's the most encouraging thing. Like the, the, the coronavirus destroyed my business. I was doing a lot of public speaking. It took it totally away. So you pivot, you adjust, you're an entrepreneur, fail and keep going. Um, and, you know, a lot of schools are where I was, high schools, colleges, I was going to start working with. They went on ice. So what do you do? Well, you, you figure it out. I've started a podcast. I wrote my second book. I, I launched different social media uh, challenges and platforms. Uh, and so right now I'm looking to grow my message because I feel it is a, a, a horrifically perfect time for me to be launching a virtual financial literacy course in the midst of a financial crisis. It wasn't stemmed from a financial crisis, but it's a becoming a financial crisis and I believe in the next five years, corporate offerings will have to include financial wellness packages in their, in their employee benefits. And I'm hoping 
that somebody will hear what I'm doing and hear my story and hear the impact that the money vehicle movement is creating in young people and young professionals' lives and allow me to continue down that journey and that path. I, you know, I, I, Oprah never got back to me about the book club. I, I'm probably going to follow up on that one. As you should. But what I hope <laughs> happens with you, and I believe this, when college athletes' careers are over, I've talked to a lot of teams about this. I would love if they gave each player like an electronic press kit that was like, this is what you've done. Here's a couple links. Here's a nice video. Here's a cool little resume element for you. Um, But also like you did this, this, and this, which is including your program, right? Which is including emotional intelligence, which is including understanding, you know, brand development and your voice beyond you as a, wide receiver or defensive back or fullback or quarterback. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see not only the workforce have what you said when you enter it, but college offer it to you. So you walk out and you've got some tools in your toolbox. You understand the landscape just a little bit more. And uh, I think the coaches I talk to, the Nick Rolovich's of the world, this, you know, next generation of coaches, and even the the ones that are older that are, you know, woke and connected, uh, they're on it. And, uh, Mm -hmm. and I think that you, as you referenced, you came along at, at, you know, what might be a really, really brilliant time for you and your, you and your thoughts and your ideals. I appreciate it, brother. And I I think college is going to be forced uh, into really seeing their value go beyond campus. And that is exactly what you're talking about is no longer am I signing a four-year scholarship. No longer am I even just going to school for, for a few years to learn. Now it is, how is this place going to stay with me for the rest of my life? or else it's not worth the value or the cost that it is today. Amen. All right. Um, Cougs in uh, 2021? Run Cougs the table? by 50. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, I don't know what we're going to do, but I, you know, that's, that's something that we need to figure out. I, actually, I'm going to be on campus virtually, so I'm becoming an adjunct professor for Washington State's business school, teaching personal finances, man. Let's go. I love it. All right. If I'm an athlete, I'm signing up for that at wazoo but if i'm an athlete anywhere else i'm really anybody with an athletic mindset i'm signing up for your course all the links will be in the show notes man i appreciate the time thank you very much it was long overdue but uh, i'm glad we finally got it in hey not a coincidence yogi roth that i'm on a mission to to help people meet what roth really means so thank you all right i love it it's jedi collins always the best dressed man at every cougar athletic fund function (laughs) trying to keep up with him Thanks for joining. Um, As always, if you want more intel or contacts or insight into humanity and sports and how to better yourself, go to yogiroth.com and subscribe to the newsletter. How Great Is Ball newsletter comes out every Saturday, game day, a proverbial game day, and uh, give yourself some insights and the notes from this podcast will definitely be in the next newsletter. All right, peace.